don't know what you call it. I call it the box. Who's on the box? And so, Mike, thanks for jumping in there. Uh, TJ was scheduled. Michelle had to have her gallbladder removed yesterday, and so they weren't expecting that. And so, um, uh, yeah, we got Mike on the box. So, yeah, we'll see how that works out. But thank you for doing that. Also, Nora, first church service, the Wentz little girl, and Nora Grace. And so glad to have um, you guys here and have Nora with us. And um, I keep saying she's so quiet and so easy. I say, you deserve quiet and easy. This is good. So I'm um, glad that's going well also. Let's take a moment and pray as we prepare our hearts to come before the Lord's table this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you as we were just singing for the work that you've done in each of our hearts. Thank you for that grace which flows and overflows into every crevice, corner, and crack of our hearts. Thank you that we can rejoice because we are forgiven. We're a forgiven people because of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the new life that we have in you, spiritually alive with you. And Lord, we thank you for that as well. I pray for your blessing upon our time as we gather around your table. I pray that you would be working in our hearts. And Lord, we thank you for this chance to remember, for this chance to focus and recalibrate our, our hearts and our minds to you and your purposes for us. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you are doing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, perhaps, we'll see if we can get this up here. Perhaps you've seen this online. It's a test in perspective and focus. And yes, it's a tree, but some of you are already seeing it's more than a tree. It's a tree of faces. And I'm going to lose you the rest of the service already. I can tell. Everybody's, whoa. How many faces do you see in the tree is the question. And so you are all, I'll let you work a minute. I'll just be quiet. Let you work a moment. Six. How many got at least six? Seven, eight, nine. Couple tens. Eleven. You might see eleven. You see eleven? Oh, I got to talk to you. I got the ten. That's as far as I can get. Uh, all right. I'll put it back up at the end of the service. I need. We got to focus here a second. All right. That's why I put a blank slide next. <laughs> There's at least ten. We'll go with that. I'll pop it back up at the end, and you can look some more. But focus in life is important. Focus is often the difference between mediocrity and excellence in what we do. When you have surgery, you want a surgeon that has focus. Or well, we might have a great reputation. He may have gone to a fantastic school. He may have incredible skills as a surgeon. He may be the best within a thousand miles, but when you go under the knife, you want that man to have focus. Uh, you don't want him hung over from the night before. Uh, you don't want him worrying about his taxes that aren't going too well. You don't want him all wound up about a relationship difficulty at home. No, you want him focusing upon you and the need that you have that he can fix. Focus is just that important. A lack of focus means issues get overlooked and missed. A lack of focus can cause us to become distracted, preoccupied, lazy, and even sloppy in our work. This morning we want to celebrate around the Lord's table together. And you can see it actually up on the communion table behind me. Jesus' words, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of of me. Uh, those are the words to his disciples on that first communion celebration. I think Jesus realized, and as it was played out later that night, even with his disciples, we're all so easily distracted by the things of this world. We have worry and anxiety. 
We get busy accumulating wealth and things, trying to provide security for ourselves and for our families. There's strained relationships. There's, there's issues of control and power, and we're, we're wrestling with all this. And yet Jesus says through coming to his table, refocus, recalibrate your minds and your hearts. Look just to my face and my purpose for you. It's like having your child or a grandchild and maybe they're, you know, it's the end of the day and they're just on overload and they're just, they're just, they're a mess. Or they've fallen down outside and they've gotten hurt or, or someone on the playground said something and hurt their feelings and they're there before you and they're crying and they're upset and they're huffing and nothing's going right and you just, you have to just finally just kneel down and you cradle their face in your hands and you say, you say, Jeff, it's going to be okay. I love you. It's going to be okay. And sometimes you have to bring that point of focus and catch their eyes and hold and cradle their face in your hands so that they understand it's okay. I'm here. We'll get through this together. I love you. And in a sense, in that moment, I, I think that's what the Lord's table is for us. It's Jesus cradling our face in his hands and saying, it's okay. I love you. You're forgiven, you're accepted, I'm with you through all the events of life. I want us to look at a familiar text this morning from Hebrews chapter 12. It's verses 1 and 2. I'll put it up here on the screen or you can look it up in your Bibles as well. It's a text I actually used when I was an RA at Moody. It was our theme verses for the floor. And these verses are packed with truth. Uh, we've been working through Romans, and it, 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 it looks at salvation through the eyes of a Gentile so that the Gentile readers could understand it by Gentile non-Jewish readers, okay? When I read Hebrews, I see it covering much of the same material but from a different angle, a different facet, because it's addressing a Jewish audience. A lot of the same topics but from a different angle and in a different kind of language that a Jewish audience would understand. So let me just read it, and then we'll go back and pull out some of the key phrases here for us this morning. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, he is now seated at the right hand of God, at the right hand of the throne of God. He starts that out there by, he says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, if you're familiar with the book of Hebrews or your New Testament, you know that the chapter just preceding this, Hebrews 11, is called the faith chapter. And there the writer just goes throughout Jewish history and pulls out important people and how God used them and the faith that they had in God's promises. He says, many have gone before, and they fought that battle of faith, and they're there to encourage us. It's, it's kind of like we've stepped out onto the arena field and, and there's this arena, this cloud of witnesses that are watching because they've been on that field before. And they know that a life of faith can sometimes be difficult, but they're there in a sense to cheer us on, to move us forward. Yesterday morning, they did the uh, run for a cure in Marshall. And if you've ever participated in one of those, the, the, you, many, t my, many times there's a, there are teams that are formed teams of a family or teams at work, and these teams, they, they run for a person. They run for a coworker. They run for a mom. They run for a sister who has battled breast cancer or maybe has lost their life to breast cancer but fought the fight, and they run with that purpose. And in a sense, I think that's what he's saying here. Since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witness, those who have battled before us, let them encourage you as you enter into this race. So he tells us and he reminds us that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness. 
But then he makes this amazing statement. He says, lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Who's he talking to here? He's speaking to you and me. He's talking to believers, and yet look what he says. Lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Do you and I battle with sin and sinful behavior? I don't know what planet you're from. I sure do. It's there. And we worked our way through the first chapters of Romans, and we had to stop at a difficult place, but it'll bring you back in the fall. Because starting in chapter 7, Paul begins to understand or begins to explain how it is that you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, those who are forgiven of our sins, past, present, and future, have received the very righteousness of Christ in the deepest part of our heart. Why do we still sin? Why does it seem so easy? And just briefly, and we'll get there when we get into the Romans, yes, we're changed at our heart, but we still live within these fleshy bodies. And these fleshly bodies have habits that we've grown up with to deal with the world around us. Some of us have found that lying is just a, a way to get through. Some of us find that addiction is a way to cope with stress. Some of us find that anger is a way to control situations. And yes, the Lord comes in and he begins to redeem. And for some of us, man, he, he's come in and he's taken that anger issue, he's taken that addiction issue, he's taken that sexual issue, and he's just taken it from you. The desire's gone. And we praise him for it. But I think for most, uh, most of us, if we're honest and we're true with one another, the reality is those areas of sin, those areas of weakness, they're always a struggle. They're always an area that we have to be careful, we have to be mindful of. We know that Satan loves to tantalize us in the areas of weakness. So for one thing, we have the flesh that we still battle until the day we die. Also in Scripture, there is sin itself. We think of sin as a verb, as things we do, lying, cheating, breaking the speed limit, things like that. Those, those, are, those are verbs, those are things we do or don't do that disappoint God. But when you look at Scripture, sin is also a noun. It is a power. It is a force. It is an influence in the world around us. And Satan loves to use sin to trip us up, to make us fall. And you know how it plays out. You stumble and you fall and you go to the Lord for forgiveness and, and, and Satan is right there and you call yourself a believer. And you really think because you went and you, you, you asked for the Lord's forgiveness and to receive it and, and yet you've done this so many times, do you really think he cares? Do you really think he's listening? And all the doubt and all the questions to make us fall and falter. But the message of this table this morning is yes, he cares. And yes, he's listening, and yes, he's forgiving, and yes, he's accepting you exactly where you are. A very real verse for the believer to lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. Notice what his prescription there is, though, as we struggle with sin that comes into our life. Lay it down. And focus on him. It sounds simple, but it takes the power of the Holy Spirit within us to do it because we love to pick it back up again, don't we? He says, lay it down. Don't focus on the sin, focus on me. It's the old, you know, when you've seen it, the, the, the fence, and it has a hole drawn in it, and it says, don't look in the hole. Well, what do people do? They go look in the hole. Or it says, wet paint, don't touch. What do we do? We touch it just to make sure it's wet. It, it, the focus has to change. Change from the difficulty you're having and focus upon Christ and what he is doing and what he has done for you and through you. There's a change, a refocus of where we are. So he says, lay, lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely 
And then he tells us to run the race with endurance. Endurance. And there's another lie that is told within the church. It's a theology that says, you know, if you come to Christ and you walk with him and, 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 and you are living a life pleasing to him, life will be good. Life will be easy. Your bank accounts will be flush. Your relationships will be marvelous. And you will be happy. Is that your experience? It's not been mine. The life of faith many times is hard. It's difficult. It's tiring. But God is working. Back to chapter 11. We look back there. The life of faith is oftentimes one of hardship, work, and endurance, as he says here. By faith, Noah, having been warned by God, he built an ark. You know how absurd that was? Hadn't even ever rained before, and God says, build an ark. I'm put the animals in it. He's like, really? It took him a hundred some years to build this thing, he and his family. Do you think those around him ridiculed him? There's Noah bipolar Noah talking to God you just imagine what it must have been like that God or that Noah through faith was obedient to God by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called Abraham I want you to uproot your family your clan I want you to head to a land I'll show you where are we going I'll tell you when you get there What's it like there? You'll know when you get there. You want me to take everybody? Yep, everybody. Can I send a scouting party? No, no, no. I want you to just pack up everyone, put it on the camels, and head west. Okay, Lord. Makes no sense. Seems life's fine here. But okay, Lord, we'll go. By faith, Moses was called out of Egypt. By faith, the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. By faith, Rahab was saved from Jer when Jericho fell. And by faith, David established God's people. Not, e not easy. And Hebrews 11 goes on to say that many of these people, even though they were obedient to what God desired, even though they were acting through faith, in their earthly lifetime, they never saw the promise fulfilled yet they were still faithful. Obedience fueled by faith. They heard, they believed, and they responded. I was thinking about that this week for us as a church family. Uh, some of you not, may not be aware, but Swan Lake in this community has a 130, 150 year history of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, of serving and meeting the needs of people here in this community. And I've shared before, that's pretty remarkable for any church to go that far and that long and hold to the truths of Scripture and to be a power and an influence within a community. Usually they get distracted, they lose focus, and other things take over. And it's not always been easy. Can you imagine what it was like living out on these plains 130 years ago? The loneliness, the crop failures. Uh, David, where's David? He's in the back. He, was, he read a poem at his grandfather's funeral. His grandfather, I think, was 95. He remembers what it was like to plow the fields with a horse. It's incredible to think what it was like to live that far back. And there were times when faith was stretched to the limit when the crops didn't come in and there wasn't a high V to run to and there wasn't insurance to draw from. You just had to make do until the next seed was put into the ground. And when the farm, when, when the crops didn't come in, it wasn't just the farmers, it was the whole community that would suffer. And yet they remained faithful and they, they, they exercised faith and obedience to what God had called them to. We've got some of those old books, and it, it's great to go back and read them, and the decision to repaint the church. And so $2.50 was set aside to buy the paint to paint the church. Times have changed a little bit, but they were faithful. 
More recently, I think of the move from out in the country up here to this current location when they built that half of the building. How absurd, how ridiculous it must have seemed to some at that moment. We have a perfectly good building here. Why would we go there? And, and why would 40 or 50 people build a building that could hold 150 to 200 people? We don't even reach that many people. Why would we do that? They were being obedient. They were stepping out in faith because God has told us to reach these communities with the good news of Jesus Christ. So they made that decision and they went. God blessed that faith. And people, you and I, are the recipients of the faith of those who have gone before us, our own cloud of witness. I was so thrilled last week because yes, that wall back there is a physical wall, and take a physical wall down, that's no big deal, guys. We've joked, why don't we just give the youth hammers and let them take care of that? It'd be kind of fun, wouldn't it? But it's a spiritual wall. It's a spiritual wall. It's a step of faith that God was calling and is calling us to. Do we need more space right now, this moment? No, look around you, there's empty chairs. But God has given us a purpose and a mission to fulfill. He wants to continue to use us to reach the people in this community. So we step out in faith, in obedience, in trusting. Is it always easy? No. Matter of fact, some of God's greatest works are the most difficult. But I was so thrilled last week and as a congregation, we responded, it's done. It's done. We're ready to take that step of faith and trust God to work. Run with endurance. The race that is set before us. Oh, man, you could do a whole sermon on that one phrase. The reality is, folks, God, God has his purposes laid out for us. We just need to walk within them he knows the purpose and the direction he wants to take us as individuals and as a church family on we just need to walk in cadence with the spirit and fulfill that role that's what he's saying the race that is set out before you a 20 mile marathon it's clearly marked the race racers they know where they've got to go and they run the course Ephesians 2 10 verse many of you know You'll want a kid. You know this one. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. But here's the censure, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And sometimes those difficulties and sometimes those hardships are part of God working in our lives to build faith, to build faith. If it was always easy, I mean, this is true in my, I, you guys, when life is good, is it harder to walk close with the Lord personally when life is good? It sure is for me. Why? Because I got this. This is okay. I can handle this. But you allow a little stress to come in from different places, and all of a sudden, man, I'm on my knees besieging, God, what are you doing? What are you saying here? God uses hardship to produce endurance of faith in our lives. So much more we can go there, but he's, he's designed the path we need to follow. He says we follow that path by what? Looking to Jesus. Again, it's easy to get distracted, isn't it? You can think of all the reasons why not and all the what ifs. He says, look to me. I will lead, I will guide, I will direct. So we run this race with this great cloud of witnesses who those who have in faith believed God and have stepped out and moved forward at times in the most absurd situations and God has blessed that. And he's telling us now, you run the race. You fulfill the purposes that I have for you because I'm here for you. 
look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. He is the one who saves us. It is his grace that pours into our lives each and every day. And when we hit those difficult times, those, those times that it just seems hard, where it seems God is absent, instead of, instead of falling apart, instead of just wondering why is God life so hard, ask these questions. Lord, what are you trying to teach me here? What do I need to learn through this? When a relationship is torn up, it's not about Marlene, it's not about one of the kids, it's not about someone at church. Lord, what... What do I need to learn here? Maybe it's humility. Maybe it's faith. Lord, what are you teaching me? Lord, heal me, yes, but help me to know you and to trust you even in the difficulties of life. Lord, help me to see your sufficiency for my every need. We're going to pause here and I'm going to ask the gentleman who helped with the communion this morning, if they would get the bread in the back and come forward, and we'll take of the bread together. Sometimes it's asked, well, what about my kids? And usually my advice is, it's, it's, it's really a decision for you as parents to make. If your children have a basic understanding, have made that basic commitment to Jesus Christ and what he has done for them, then they need to partake. Use it as a teaching opportunity. Talk them through what it represents and help them be a part of that. Um, the reality is all of us, even as adults, we grow more and more every day in our understanding of our salvation. So if they've expressed that interest, by all means, allow them to participate, okay? It could be when they're six. It might be when they're 16. It doesn't, that's up to the individual, all right? One of the gentlemen would please pray for the bread this morning. As the plate's being passed, use this time just to quietly reflect before the Lord. Thank Him for the forgiveness that is ours. Uh, maybe there's a realization, yep, there's a sin that I need to lay down. And I need to look to Jesus, my Savior, to, to move forward. But just some quiet time with the Lord. Scriptures tell us for I, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed he took some of the bread 
When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. hold just a moment back to our verse again verse 2 looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross it was a work to be done it could only be done by Christ himself when we think of the cross we think of anguish and pain shame and death but Jesus himself there was a sense in which Surely, Father, there's another way. You'll remember his words in Matthew 26. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. But then I look at this verse, and did you see what it says there? For the joy that was set before him. Joy. Real joy. Joy happiness, contentment. Yes, there's anguish and death at the cross, but at the same time, there was a settled, deep, inner joy. Because Jesus realized what was being accomplished through his death. That he was drawing all men and all women to himself. That he was making a way to God possible to what he was doing on the cross. Was it painful and agonizing and ugly? You bet. But even in all the horrificness of the passion of the Christ, there is a settled joy for what was accomplished. You're thinking, well, how can that be? How can anyone facing one of the most cruelest forms of punishment and death find joy? The only thing I could think of that we could relate to was giving birth. I remember when Jennifer was born, Marley went and uh, water broke at three in the morning. She said, it's time to call the doctor. And I said, now? She goes, yes, now. I'm like, but it's three in the morning. I don't care, call him. And we drove in and she was in labor most of the rest of the morning and into the afternoon and things weren't always going easy. Uh, we, had, we were part of a church plan and had a young pastor and he had come and he was visiting and he visited and he continued to visit and he didn't know how to leave and he continued to visit and I had learned a long time ago all those childbirthing classes they're, they're fun to go through they're not much help on the day um, Marlene's gonna breathe when she wants to breathe and she'll let you know that and um, she finally pulled me over and she says get Philippe out of here <laughs> and so it's painful it hurts it can be long and, and, and yet, through that process, at the point that that child is born and it's handed to that mom and she's cradling that child against her breast, there's just, there's just incredible joy. Was the pain and agony and suffering of the last 12 or 24 hours, was it worth it? Absolutely. Was it fun? Was it something I want to go through every day? Absolutely not. But in the pain and in the suffering, I brings joy. And I think that was Jesus at the cross. There was anguish, there was pain, but there was joy. One more thought, and he closes with this, and we hit on this a few weeks ago. Where is Jesus now? Seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Don't miss the implication there. As he said from the cross, it is finished. It's done. I have done the work that the Father had for me to do. Your salvation is secure. It's finished. 
he is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God, interceding for you and I. His work is complete. I don't know about you, but there are those days, especially now when it's raining and you fertilize the yard and it seems like twice a week you got to go out and cut it and trim it and take care of it and things are growing faster than you really want them to. And at the end of the day, what do you do? You go inside, you eat dinner, and you sit down. Your work is done. Jesus is seated today. His work is complete. And that's an incredible promise to you and I to grab in faith and to realize our salvation is done. It's secure because it rests in Him. It is complete. Gentlemen, if you would bring the cup forward, please. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the work that you did for us. Thank you, as Paul says in Colossians 3, that we have been raised with Christ. So now we seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Father, it's all about you. It's all about you. We humble ourselves before you this morning. We focus and we calibrate our hearts and our minds upon you and your purposes for us. We thank you for this opportunity to rejoice in the salvation that is ours through Christ Jesus. Amen. reading from 1 Corinthians 11. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Gentlemen will come and they'll pass the baskets around so you have something to do with the cups. Uh, also, on the first Sunday of the month, we like to take a benevolent offering to help with some of the needs within the church family and the community. Um, you guys have always been so incredibly generous in that process, and we thank you. Uh, this past month has been a month of uh, more needs than usual, and so just uh, thank you for your for your giving and. Uh, I think Dave is going to come and cover a couple announcements for us, and then we will be done. All right? Thank you.
I'll have a gentleman come forward with the plates as a you know, pray for the benevolence offering. Lord, uh, we do praise you that you care for us and all that you've done for us. And I pray that we would, out of that heart, give to others and pray for this offering. Now that we take it, that it would be to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, just a couple of announcements to uh, highlight what's going on here at church. The, uh, uh, the June 21st to 25th is VBS. You've all been hearing about it. It's a little.